everybody to the second episode of No Cap the Podcast with your hosts Adeleke Carrera and myself Scott Held. And today we are joined by a special guest, our very own music curator slash producer slash artistic <laughs> expert, <laughs> Kyle Bellingham. <laughs> Kyle, how are you doing, man? I'm not too bad, bro. I'm not too bad. Thank you for having me for this little intro. How are you guys doing? Amazing. Good, good. Amazing. How are you holding up over in um Scotland? Cause you're in lockdown right now, right? Uh, kind of. I mean, like they don't, they haven't called it an official lockdown, but it's more or less a lockdown. Uh, yeah. I mean, to be honest, like I don't even notice like that change anymore. You kind of, I feel like I just live in the house nowadays anyways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like no lie. I live in the house most of the time, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's fine, bro. Um, just trying to get by, trying to just keep busy, keep a routine moving, you know, all that stuff. I feel like everyone's kind of feeling the same kind of like stale feeling of like not being able to do too much right now, you know, for sure. For sure. We're uh, on a bit more of an eventful note. We're recording this about uh, a week, week and a half after the U.S. elections. Um, mm, yes, sir. Which was a, uh, an interesting little period to follow. Uh, I'm sure you boys were keeping up with it. So It was stressful, man. It was super uh, it was stressful. stressful. It was crazy. <laughs> it felt like the crazy. world was just on pause for that whole time even yeah. here in switzerland like i didn't expect it but everyone was just talking about it the media like completely stopped talking about covid here and was just giving us updates mm. every second about Everything the election else. yeah man which yeah. is i mean we know what happened now biden won um mm -hmm. so there's that i think um one of the things I, I was, because I was keeping up with a lot of media coverage during the election, and Van Jones, a, a CNN analyst, someone who I have a lot of respect for, like as a reporter, as somebody in the career and, and such, um, he, he made a really good point about the election, which I think uh, like warrants mention, which is that um, Biden won, so the Democrats won. Um, eventually, as the numbers came out, we started to see the margin between the, the two parties and between Biden and Trump. But I think for the most part, it was, a, it was a close election. In these battleground states, it was a close election. It was tight. Like you guys said, it was stressful. And I think something that he said, which, was, which really resonated with me, was that um, I think before the election, a lot of Democrats, a lot of liberals, a lot of people in general thought there would be this mass rejection of the past four years, of the, the, the most recent presidency, and of the ideals that came along with it. And they were kind of hoping for this massive social and moral rejection and that never happened and i think you look mm -hmm. at it now the u.s is yes biden will be president still an extremely divided country and i think for a lot of people that may have been disappointing in a sense to see that the events of these last four years may not have swayed that many people away from certain positions that they might have held um i think politics very much became it was a lot more differences in morals versus differences in policies, the morality and certain viewpoints is kind of what dominated the rhetoric of the last few years. And I thought it was, um, I mean, it's disappointing because, you know, regardless of what the outcome is, it kind of goes to show how divided U.S. politics remains and still is. Obviously, I'm in politics, so that's something that's interesting for me and to look forward to. But just uh, I thought that was a really good point that I feel like, you know, people need to I've seen a lot of knee-jerk reactions on social media. I know Lucky and me mm. were talking about this before. A lot of people yeah. jumping to conclusions and such. I think people need to see it with a bit more nuance and understand the reality of the, the situation, which is still a extremely difficult one, you know? No, for sure, man. I mean, this, the, the kind of scary thing about the election was that, I mean, yeah, I mean, in the end, it was clear that Biden won via like uh, the electoral votes and everything. Mm. Um, but it was still such a, like a half-half situation in mm. terms of like, the actual people of the US. And like you were saying, and it's an absolutely excellent point. Like, I think that's the scary reality of it is that even though kind of the first step of Biden being voted in um, is done, it's not the step at all that like causes any kind of positive change in a way. If anything, it's just preventing what was going to be obvious further negative change. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. but we're still in very much in a you know like a position of standstill, and that's so odd for me to say as like a non-U.S. citizen or non-American. Um, but it's so crazy when like politics of one country, especially given it's a place as big as the U.S., um, kind of does portray like a more global image and a more like global impact of the results of these elections. For sure, 
Yeah. I completely agree. And I think something that I think is very important that people have to realize is although Biden has won, the job is not done yet. People have to hold him. (laughs) (laughs) But they have to hold him accountable now for his plans and actions that are going to follow suit. Sure. Because the U.S. is going, is very divided, especially now after the results of the elections. And the administration now coming in has a lot that has to be changed and a lot to fix. Yeah. past mistakes i mean i saw and the a, thing a, sorry go just, ahead just to kind of build on that i saw a great point like yeah uh, i think it was i don't know exactly what the popular vote came out to be it said like 72 million people voted for biden like okay like another 67 million people still voted for trump like those people mm. don't just go away now like those still those are still people that you have to people factor in there. to every decision that you make and every aspect of like pro- political progression in this country you know so i think you know like you said there's a lot of work that needs to be done going forward. And I hope people realize that and take that into account. And the crazy thing as well is like, uh, I, uh, given it was such a close vote, I mean, like I said, I'm still, we're, I'm still very content that Biden won over Trump, mm-hmm. but it, it was still a, a settling for Biden as a candidate, at least yes. personally, I'm yeah. not gonna speak on behalf of everyone, um, but you know, it's kind of like the lesser of the two evils in a sense, um, or the one that allows for the most like potential for positive change to come um but you know that potential still needs to be realized and like the influence still needs to be put onto biden and everything and like you said i guess kind of just the pressure and the time will tell um what happens now for sure but it's not like the u.s was in a very good place before so you you can (laughs) hope that the only place it can go up is up you know (laughs) yeah hopefully we'll see man we'll see um for sure yeah so we had that happen in the last uh last week and a half obviously covid still going on still out there in case some of y'all forgot (laughs) Um, hey man wear your mask please yeah Yeah. bro lecky tell us when's switzerland going to lockdown dog because y'all are struggling hey switzerland (laughs) will not go into a lockdown i'm telling you switzerland will change nothing man Switzerland, we're staying as we are (laughs) no it's pretty (laughs) funny though because so switzerland's not going into a lockdown but every other country around us now is so mm. Austria, I think yesterday decided to basically go into lockdown until December 3rd or 5th, somewhere around then. Shout out France has been in a lockdown. <laughs> Germany has been in a lockdown now for over a week, but the yeah. Swiss are like, nope, yeah. ain't no problem over here. Yeah. That's- <laughs> Dude, they, but I, I even remember being in Switzerland like uh, during the kind of more like quarantine period or back in like March, April, May. And like, I remember like, as people were starting to be like, let out to do things again, it was like a total change of behavior from this one of like panic to one of, oh, let's just like completely go back to normal life. Mm-hmm. And I feel like even now with the rising cases, even though it's so much worse than it was back in like March in, in Switzerland, um, people just really like, I will stand their ground that like, we need to continue normal life, you know? Yeah. Even though like normal life can still continue if in, in a form, if you just like respect certain simple things like wearing a mask. People over here in Edinburgh who don't wear a mask or like wear it wrong, nothing nothing pisses me off more than someone who has their mask under their nose. It's like, like just take that's it off, classic. Like you might as well take it off. <laughs> it's like, you're not achieving anything here, man. Yeah. No, I mean, even Vancouver's seen a spike in cases. They just did a lot of new restrictions. So uh, thank right, you to okay. everybody who went out to turn up during Halloween. Uh, we got exactly what y'all wanted, which is same uh, thing happened over here though, man. Stuck Halloween in the crib, man. Dude, I swear it was like over here. It was like no rules were in place for Halloween. Yeah. I went out for like a walk at like 10 p.m., 10:30. Every single street had one or two house parties going on. It loud as fuck. You're Tons of people on it, up, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like for real. No wonder on, these man. cases keep going up, bro. Yeah. Like people think Halloween like you're immune on that day or something. You know, <laughs> day of the dead. Yeah, we all good. It's crazy. <laughs> um i want to just touch on the the episode that we got coming up today um so me and leke had a fantastic interview with um sylvester mensah one of my um buddies here in vancouver somebody who's been very involved in music event management culture just a whole bunch of different projects he's had going on within uh his collective that he's part of uh the other side club um so that was we had a fascinating conversation to be on which went a ton of different directions lucky if you kind of want to you know give your thoughts we just came off that 
Yeah, no, we had a really good talk with um, Sylvester, a very well-rounded person you know, who's involved in a lot of different projects. Um, we started kind of talking about his diverse background because he's from a Ghanaian background, Ghanaian family, but then lived in the UK, but also went to boarding school in Canada by himself, left very early around his early teen years, and then has been involved with the Student Society at UBC for helping host events, but then also created his own events with the Dear Vancouver Tour and My Dearest Tour. Mm -hmm. A great project called The Other Side Club that he further explains in the podcast. And now it was a really good one. Yeah, just a, a great talk. Shout out to Sly for hopping on. I'm excited for you guys to hear that. Um, we'll hop into that in a little bit. Any of you boys got just, anything to... Yeah, I, I, I want to, now that I'm, I'm able to be here, I'm not going to let it just slide over that I saw you guys are part of the, the Spotify Next Wave program now. Yes. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. I saw okay. that. Okay, if you want to talk I, about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I can't lie. I was gassed to see you guys even on Spotify. Then you're part of this new new program. I'm like, bro, let me, let me tell you, it it's hit official. different when I go on Spotify. And I see my own podcast there. I'm like, I, <laughs> successful man. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Like, shit. <laughs> but yeah, Lucky, tell me about how that unfolded. Uh, yeah. So first off, big shout out to Julia. She actually sent us a picture of the Spotify Next Wave program and told us that they were doing that. So we looked into it, and basically, what the Spotify Next Wave is is that they're looking for the next generation, so student podcasters to kind of help create and, you know, be the voice of the next generation. So with that, they basically encourage students to apply for the Next Wave program, which we did and, you know, thankfully got accepted into. And a really dope feature about it is, is that we get access to a top-notch editing program through Spotify. And we're also going to be part of a um, digital master class being held with some of the top tier podcasters on spotify i think on december 4th that's amazing so we'll get that's to so learn sick. firsthand from them as well and you know, hopefully keep on growing the pod yeah yeah 100 super, super man. exciting man and uh you know ways to go yeah before even episode two came out though yeah. i just see this pop up you know <laughs> yeah man. just you know moving up kinda, quick, moving up quick. <laughs> you know to, to end on that, before we get right into episode two, a big shout out to everybody who listened to the podcast, shared the podcast, reached out to us. I got a lot of great feedback from people. Um, I know Leke did as well, which was amazing. So yep. we appreciate y'all coming out to support episode one. Keep supporting for episode two. And it's only going to get better from here, y'all. For real. Best we appreciate it. Yeah. Family over here. All facts, Family. no fiction. You know the All drill. Facts, no, no fiction. fiction. <laughs> Hi, y'all. <laughs> It's uh, episode two of the No Cap Podcast with our special guest, Sylvester Mensah. I hope you guys enjoy. All right, y'all. We are joined today by a very special guest, uh, my brother, Sylvester Mensah, part of the Other Side Club, part of the UBC AMS team. Sly, how are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. And yourself? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. How's COVID been treating you these past couple of months? Um... I don't know. COVID, COVID has been, it's come as a, it came at a, at a good time. I got to say, I don't know. I've been taking it easy, obviously checking on my family, making sure that my own health is, is good. Um, you know, respecting social distancing and the regular, mm -hmm. you know, health and safety precautions. But um, yeah, no, for me, I think that this period was just a, a good kind of standstill to everything going on, just to take it all in and actually like, reflect on, on things that really most but obviously that that came with its own challenges with you know people getting sick and so many different things happening around the world so it's just trying to get a balance and i, I think sure. that's that's what the main thing is for me yeah man. yeah yeah i want to um start off by talking a bit about your background so you grew up in ottawa with Ghanaian parents and obviously spent the last few years of your life now in vancouver um, talk to us about your experiences growing up around so many vast different cultures in two such yeah. diverse cities as well. What impact did they have on you growing up? Yeah, um, so I actually, so I, I grew up in Ghana. So I was actually born in Ghana, um, lived there till about, um, I'll say like 2015. And then I moved to Ottawa um, for high school. 
um, but I, I just moved by myself. So my, my family was still back home in Ghana. So that that moment, I would say, has been, I guess, the most like monumental in my life, I guess, just moving to a different city, different country, different continent, um, I guess, just caring for myself and just being as independent as independent can be. Um, I think during those periods in time, I kind of just grew exponentially just in terms of my maturity and just my ability to just think for myself. Um, it was it was definitely a culture shift, but I, I had I had been um, I had been like elsewhere. So I had I lived in the UK for about a year or two when I was much younger. So I was kind of I was kind of used to or quite familiar with I guess the weather and like the people, but um yeah no i don't know how i did it um in terms of ottawa um i was actually in boarding school so there wasn't really much um to do like my whole life was kind of like scheduled for me um but coming to vancouver I, I felt like um vancouver really gave me the ability to just explore different things that were just like different things just out of curiosity um i, I find that it's it is a it's it's a small city and um, there's really much the same people who do the same things. So mm -hmm. um, coming to the city, I was just trying to, you know, just make sure I was with the right crowd, getting to know the right people in terms of the things that I wanted to do. So um, right off the bat, I, I got involved with um, Front Runners, um, which is a clothing brand here in Vancouver. Um, and it's, it's quite crazy because most of the people who worked with front runners were also doing other things. So either promoters at clubs or um, having their own like event um, curation kind of groups going on. Um, so I'll say that's how I got involved um, in, I guess, like the Vancouver scene um, mm -hmm. regarding like music or events. Um, and yeah, no, really diverse upbringing and kind of like different cities combined together I, I kind of see myself as um i guess uh i don't know what i'm about to say there so i'll just stop there <laughs> like, like a global citizen almost bit yeah. all over the place. um i mean because you bring up like getting involved in in front runners and uh that sort of like getting incorporated into vancouver so was that were those years the point where you realized that you wanted to become more involved in music and event management or did you already have an idea that that was kind of a passion of yours coming into university yeah so coming coming into university um i, I reconnected with um an old friend of mine um and at that time he was um he, he was interested in i guess getting involved in like the event creation scene um more so more specifically for like artist management so in terms of like putting on shows or trying to find shows for for an artist that he represents um so i kind of got involved in that like coming into ubc um and it just so happened that i was able to um you know make these connections so initially i was interested in you know i wanted to i wanted to model um that was really one of the reasons why i got involved with front runners but also with the stuff I was doing on the side, um, it, it kind of worked well together because it kind of felt like if we're going to start um, putting on shows or we're going to start um, our, our music stuff, we may as well start now when uh, I have access to, to these individuals who um, pretty much like run the city to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'll I'd say, I'd say it was a bit of both, but um, personally, I... I at the end of the day, and, and most things that I get involved with, I, I just try to make sure there's something tying back to my own like passion project. So um, for other side, it's kind of like a no brainer in terms of like the different things I've gotten involved with, just because um, they help improve upon my skill set. And then I'm able to, you know, bring that back to the team um, mm -hmm. and, and put together and execute everything or anything we have going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know a while back you hosted your first kind of collaborative event I think it was called Dear Vancouver, right? Mm -hmm. Which um, brought together like a bunch of local artists and some as well from outside of Vancouver. So talk to us a bit about the process of what was what that was like, you know, starting your own event and some of the difficulties yeah. you may have faced doing that. Yeah, I know it's so with the, so the series was called My Dearest Tour. Um, it was a, a, a tour that was, it was a, it was it was a tour that was made up of just like a, a collection of events 
um, we wanted to make this global um, just because like there was no reason why we couldn't. Mm. Um, and with that, it was more so the idea of hosting various installations of, of a certain show in different cities um, with the idea of trying to promote our own artists, but still trying to give local artists and those communities um, the ability to, you know, come together um, and, you know, just show their craft. Um, and, and for me, I, I kind of really valued our ability to execute those just because, again, I, I was planning this from Vancouver. Um, my, my co-founder was also planning this from Atlanta. Um, and we're planning shows in like Toronto and Montreal and cities where we were not living in. Um, so I, I would say kind of like the challenges in terms of like communication and trying to set things up when you're not there in person. Um, it, it really it really gave us a, a lot of experience and a lot of insight into the industry. Obviously, everything did not go as planned, but there were also um, a lot of good highlights in terms of the ability to um, connect with, with people that we would not have even expected to connect with. So even with, with our very first show, we planned it in Toronto. Um, and, um, you know, we flew into Toronto like a week before the show just to make sure that the venue was set, the artists were in check, and just to do some last minute promo, just because again, being in Vancouver and then um, Auden being in Atlanta, we obviously <laughs> did not really know what the city was saying or mm -hmm. if people really mm -hmm. knew about this event, even though we we're promoting on like social media and et cetera. Um, so we flew into the city um, at least like a, a week before the show. Um, and in that week, we literally just like canvassed around like the, the um, U, U of T campus, just handing out flyers, telling people that we have a show coming on. Um, and through that, we made a lot of like good connections that till this day, like we're still in touch. Um, so one thing that happened off the fly, we, we ended up like on Queen Street and, and walked into this like store, sorry. So yeah, we, we were on Queen, Queen Street and walking to the store um, and it ended up being a clothing brand called Get Fresh Company, which is um, like a streetwear brand in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just like checking out the store and telling them about the stuff we had going on. Um, and they showed like a lot of interest in it. And to us, it was like, it meant a lot because for one, we had nothing to prove our, for ourselves. We were literally about to host our very first show. Um, we did not live in the city. Um, so kind of everything looked impossible and everything looked like this was probably going to fail. Um, but they, they fell in love with the idea. Um, the owners actually decided to come to the show. Um, and like on the day, um, we had a, we had, you know, we had a bigger crowd than we had expected. I think we had about a hundred people there. Um, but it was also a really small venue. So it was expected or supposed to be kind of, um, I guess, very intimate and mm -hmm. very close and more emphasis on like the shared experience happening in the space um so yeah no i'll say it, it was definitely challenging um but i think it's that's one of the reasons why i'm kind of excited that or happy that we actually did it just because um you know some things may seem impossible but if you're able to at least put in the effort there's always something good to come out of it and i think as of where we are today as other side um a lot of these um experiences um starting from the my Gira store um all come together and, and make our story even even much i guess more interesting to tell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i want to because you you mentioned how like you've done a couple of different shows in a couple of different cities and obviously each city and each city's nightlife has kind of its own vibe so you know vancouver is different from toronto which is different from montreal from atlanta and so on so how is it dealing with these different vibes and what, I guess, what particularly moments or aspects of the cities really stood out to you when you were doing this? Yeah, no, nah, that's a good question. Cause like, you literally cannot just like walk into someone else's city and like, <laughs> and yeah. do whatever you want. Exactly. That, that's, that's something we learned and we learned the hard way. Um, and this was more so with regards to Montreal. So for Montreal, like the, the nightlife is, 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 is great. Like it's, it's a really nice city. Um, but we, we, we made, we made a couple, we, we made a, so leading up to the show again, just like the Toronto show obviously had to get to the city early. So we were on the ground and just to make sure that people actually know that this is happening. 
Um, so normally what happens is we, we try to get artists that have the ability to like pull a crowd mm -hmm. and we kind of base the following or the attendance from that city on that artist, but also just on our network. But for Montreal in particular, we're kind of expecting the artist to, you know, like show up with the crowd because these were artists that, that we believed to be, I guess, like to have like a, a significant following, so to say. Mm -hmm. So we come day of the event, realize that there's literally no one there, um, which was really, really bad. Don't ask me how that happened, but it did happen. <laughs> yeah. um, so what we're doing, we're, we were selling tickets ahead, but the venue of the tickets, which again, sh should not have happened. Um, and they were communicating to us that like, you know, ticket sales were going well. So we were okay, you know, okay, marketing is fine. There's nothing else we need to do. We just need to come to the show and that's it. Mm -hmm. We show up to the show, the show has the list. It's actually like two people on the list and the venue is empty. And we're like, okay, like this is a fucking shit show. What are we gonna yeah. do? Yeah. So obviously not trying to like end the night just like that. We decided to go out from the street and tell people that it's a show happening and try to get them into the, into the venue. So I can't really speak French, neither could Auden speak French, mm. but we did have some people who could speak French. And it so happened that the venue was in a, was in a part of Montreal where the people there probably only spoke French, um, or even if they do speak English, like they probably would not speak to you in English. Um, I'm not too sure, I don't, I don't remember the name, the specific location, but it wasn't in the city itself. So we're outside, we see a bunch of people like walking somewhere and we start talking to them and like no one is listening to us. So we're speaking English, we're speaking like broken French, like no one's listening to us. So we decided yeah. to just like follow them. And we realized that there was like a house party happening like a block across and there was this long line going to the house party. And we're like, raw, like all these people can't get into this party, come to our party for fuck's sake. Yeah, so yeah. we started talking to everyone on the line Telling them that the show happening, they should come with free tickets, you get free drinks, etc. Um, yeah, they did not listen to us at all. Um, <laughs> I think whatever they had going on was probably a, a banger. So they were all they all wanted to stand in line. So yeah. we like spent like 30 minutes trying to convince them, but at the end of the day, none of them left. And it was also like kids our age or even younger, which was also which is like the sad part. <laughs> so um, I would say that was kind of like my rude awakening in terms of, um, I guess, an introduction into a city or just like how to go about things. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if we were to do this again, we we're obviously not going to just like go into the city and just plan this ourselves exclusively. We're most likely going to collaborate with like a, a different group in the city just to actually have some credibility and give people a reason to come um so yeah i'll say i'll say that was like an experience that really i guess portrayed the difference in i guess just this lifestyle in the city yeah I, f I feel like if this was to happen in like toronto or in, in vancouver and like people are walking on the street and you have a show happening and people are in a line to go somewhere if you tell them to come for free they're probably going to come as long as yeah. it's like pretty close mm -hmm. um but i think just because you know we, we didn't really fit that cultural identity for them they they did not like our english or french so they kind of just told us to fuck off yeah i mean which i guess it's one of those things like you live and you learn because obviously i was at the yeah. the two shows that you put on in vancouver and those yeah. were i mean completely successful and there was also progression between the shows there was a lot more people yeah. at the second show than the first show so yeah. you know it differs from city to city and obviously you know you can't have everything pop off and be as successful as you might want it to be exactly but, exactly I want to, um, because you were mentioning how you guys obviously bring in a lot of local artists from the city that you're in. At the same time, you mentioned that you have sort of your own artists that you already know pers personally that you might be bringing in from overseas. Like I know you got a couple guys from down in Atlanta. You bring one man's over from France. So talk to me about how when you're going through the artist selection for the show, what goes through that process and like who you're bringing in. Uh, homegrown versus who you're bringing in from the city itself okay that's that's a good question um so at other side we we manage three artists so we do have our own kind of um collective artists that that we manage in terms of um either 
handling the distribution, handling marketing, and also just like handling their kind of like business like conversations. Um, and those are the three artists that you mentioned. So there's one in, in Atlanta called Yana Rood. Um, there's one in, in Paris known as Rosie. And then um, there's a singer in the UK called Mana. Um, and with regards to like the, I guess, the selection process for getting an artist onto our, I'll say like label or team, it's more so looking for someone that's unique in whatever they do. Um, because I do believe that music is a, at a point in time where there is there are kind of new sounds coming and individuals are, are being creative in their ability to like intertwine various genres to, to create a whole new sound of their own. And um, for us, we, we, we like things that are different from the status quo, things that give people a reason to want to listen again, a reason to want to find out more. Um, just that element of curiosity, we believe, is, is a, a really good marketing product, be it through your sound, through it, through your actual marketing and et cetera. So in terms of the, that's kind of like the locker that goes into, I guess, arriving on, on an artist and saying, hey, this person will be great to work with us. It also so happens that these three artists were uh, models prior to being artists. So they started off um, with modeling careers. They all model still. Mm -hmm. um, and a huge part of their following is from the modeling industry, um, um, which also really works well with, with what we do, because as at other side, we try to we try to get or offer a piece of everything. So um, we have projects that are in like the fashion industry, music industry, art, visual art, digital art, all of it. Um, so have different creative elements that they offer. Um, really, really fully represents our, our identity as a creative house that seeks to, um, you know, make various impacts in various fields. Um, but when it comes to the actual show, obviously for all the shows we've done, we always want to make sure that we have at least one of our artists there. So in terms of like the selection process, either bring in all of our artists or, or whoever can attend. Um, and with regards to like artists in the city, um, Given, I guess I've been I've been in Canada for the past like four years. Um, I have like friends who are, I went to high school with who are pretty much like all over um the country right now. So for the most part, we were I was really tapping into my own kind of friend circles in terms of, like the artists and the crowds. Um, and, and these were people that that I knew and people who, whose music that I personally liked. Um, but sometimes we do you know search on the gram see. Um, you know, which artists or which bands are, are doing, you know, things differently or doing things creatively. Um, and then from that, we just like shoot them a DM, tell them what's going on, um, and then, you know, bring them on board. So in terms of like this local artist, um, there isn't too much that goes into that process. There's more so someone we like and someone who's available to, mm -hmm. to show up um, and also someone who can bring some sort of a crowd. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also someone no, you, who's like rel and someone who's relevant to the crowd. So for instance, if we're doing something at UBC, obviously trying to get a UBC artist out there. Or if we're doing something, let's say like downtown or um in like one of let's say like a, a red gate art society for, for that show, for instance, um we work with locals only, yeah. um, which is um um like a, a an event curation um group here in Vancouver. So they were able to, um, I guess, source us some of their artists, um, and that kind of kept that balance and kept that relevance to the city. And was was Redgate? That was for the first year, of Vancouver, right? Yeah, you guys yeah, yeah. Because I remember yeah. that was a very much like a extremely diverse group of local artists. Yeah, it was really music exactly. from all different genres, which was super interesting to be around. Yeah. You know. And we had an art exhibition going on. I even forgot. <laughs> yeah, you had the art. You had front runners was there as well. You guys had a little yeah. bit of everything going on. So that was that was yeah. very dope to see. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That makes you were just talking about you know with having your own artists that you guys represent with the other side club, but then at your events, you know you kind of as well try to promote the grassroots community. Um, what does it mean to you, and why do you think? It those who give local artists a platform of at these events you host. It's so it's it's more so um, it's more so wanting to give 
just other people are platform. Um, so it's with at other side, like it's the, our identity, our philosophy is, you know, being able to be impactful in, in whatever we do, um, even if it's in, 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 the, in the like the slightest way possible, um, whatever it is we're doing should have a community aspect of it, that there should be something in it for other people who were not involved in the planning process. Um, and, and that's something that really drives a lot of the, the creative work that we're doing right now. Um, making sure we're, we're tying into some sort of like like social responsibility for, for other people to take away. So it's more so being able to to create a community with, with, with the stuff that we're doing and being able to, to give other people the ability to interpret it in the way that they like to, but also to contribute in, in that creation process. Um, so that, that exactly, that, that kind of was showed through, um, I guess, being able to, or being willing to give other people a platform. Um, but also it's, it's, it's a case that we do need those local artists or, or those other people from the community to be a part of it in order for, um, let's say, other people in the community to want to be part of it. Because again, this is not my city. I just showed up here, wanted to do my own thing. Um, it's more so being able to pay homage to the individuals who are probably already trying to get themselves established in that location, or maybe other people who would also just, you know, be curious enough to, to try to, to create something new in a new space. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've obviously, you've talked about other side a lot. And just for, for those people listening who might not completely know of it or know what exactly what it is, can you just kind of break down really what other side is and also who the people are behind it? Because that's been a big part of your life for these last couple of years, obviously. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a big task. I'm <laughs> break down other side. Um, so I would say, honestly, uh, other side, in terms of what it is now, um, was only realized in the past like six months. Um, so from beginning of quarantine till now, um, this is when we've had the chance to really grow our or establish our brand identity and work towards a goal. Um, prior to that, we were more in the just event creation. So we did our my dearest tour series and then we realized that okay like this is really fun but we feel like this is probably just a puzzle um and other side to us is kind of like the the bigger picture the bigger map that gives us the ability to do many different things but with the same agenda i.e the agenda of being able to be impactful the agenda of being able to give back to the community the agenda of being able to you know be a role model and set standards for people behind us and also the people before us um, to be able to, you know, be in this industry, but also be in this industry with the idea that there is much more to it than just, I guess, the, the benefits that come with it. So it's more so being able to, to be a creative just for the love of being a creative and hence on um, being able to, um, because I feel like when you start putting like the um, bureaucracy into it, or you start putting, I guess, like the business aspects into it, um, a, a lot of artistic ability um, really disappears. Mm -hmm. um, so other side is simply put, we, we're a creative house. Um, um, our, our main selling point is our ability to um, tell stories through the various products or projects that we put together. Um, within our creative house, um, we have I believe a team of about eight individuals. Um, on this team, we have a photographer by name Dalali. Um, he's um, located in Toronto. Um, we have um, a, a DJ and and um, uh, a sound. So okay, let me let me actually start. Let me <laughs> let me let me let me let me be more logical yeah, in explanation. Yeah, yeah. So our, let me let me let me mention the team again. Um, so we have a photographer um, who lives in Toronto. Um, we have a team of four in Vancouver. Um, that includes um, our sounds team, our culture team, um, and our kind of, um, I guess, web design team. 
Um, and also in Atlanta, that's where um, we have um, three other members of our team. So we, the co-founder, Auden, um, AK, another member of our sounds team, um, and then also Yano, our artist. Um, so it's kind of individuals working together on the same goal, same purpose, but from different locations. And the way we actually became a team, um, I feel like the, the, the ability for all of us being from diverse upbringings and still being able to be here at this point in time and work on this special goal is kind of like the motivation that we get to do what we're doing because in a way it kind of makes the world seem really small and makes anything really possible, especially if you have someone who's coming from Iran, someone who's coming from Ghana, someone who's coming from Senegal, someone's coming from China and all together, we're all, we all find ourselves in either in Vancouver or in other cities, but are still able to transmit our energies and, you know, connect somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, again, the ability of, of us to create a team like that um, is kind of what really like motivates us and, and gives us that sense of community in terms of being able or, or having the responsibility to always give back to the city that we're in. Um, so as a creative house, we try to be or we, we are multidisciplinary in terms of the, the contents we put out, but also in that we're, we're, we're not just trying to create for the for the sake of creating, we're trying to create things that are new. Um, and, and one thing that we say a lot is that we, we try to push the boundaries in, in the various industries that we're in. Um, and again, I, I think I think that's my explanation on the other side. Hopefully yeah. that made sense. <laughs> I mean, because I was going to say, you guys, like it definitely, it started out as very much like event management and hosting yeah. oriented. And then as you mentioned, over the last couple of months, that kind of evolved. And now it's almost like a, a page of like a lot of different aspects of culture and like all the different projects that you're working on. So was that kind of like, was that something that you guys had pre-planned and it just happened to work out like this? Or did with COVID popping up, were you like, you know, we can't host any events right now is the perfect time to build our brand online and expand beyond what we were doing before. Yeah, no. So um, we're, we're, we were never really event creators or curators. Um, I think that was, that was like the, the first thing that was the first tangible thing that we were able to arrive at mm -hmm. um, with like the idea and the vision that we had. Um, we, we've always, in terms of like what we're doing right now, it, it's always been, it's always been a part of the agenda. It's, it's always been a part of the identity. It's just that we, we started with, with one thing. Um, and then with that one thing, we realized that, okay, like, sure. Like this is one way to go about this, but we're able to do this through various other ways as well. And hence, um, we decided to kind of spread ourselves out. Um, and tap into different industries because um, we're, we're not going to be, well, we will be, but again, when we started, we we're just young kids trying to do something. Um, and again, if we're saying we're event creators or event curators, sure, we, we can curate very, very great events. But if you're comparing us to like a professional event curator, we probably may not like, we, we may, we, we, we may not like stand the test, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's more so that we we just out of curiosity we like to put our ideas into execution, and it's more so the ability to think about something and put it together as opposed to um just running on just one specific thing. So with regards to what we do right now, um again it was something that we did want to do or we we were going to do prior to now, but it's also the case that quarantine also kind of highlighted various aspects in the industry that could still succeed in a time where individuals are just on their screen at home looking for things to do. Um, mm -hmm. So I think in a way that that was kind of like a push that we needed to get to work because prior to then we were always like thinking and talking about all the many things that we wanted to do, um, but we never really had the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of quarantine gave us that ability or the uh, kind of the luxury of time to test out our ideas, to test out things that we've been talking about 
and try to execute them and see if they were successful enough to, to make them our own. And I would say, yeah, that, that's how we kind of got to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, I talk too much. <laughs> oh, these are just interesting stories because it's, it's really, you know, the path of how these things came to be. Like, it's not like yeah. a linear process. So Yeah, exactly. No, it's, I, I think I feel like my my recounting of these stories are just all over the place. So I'm so sorry. Hopefully, <laughs> nah, nah, hopefully, you're good. Nah, you're hopefully good. there's some good bits coming out of it. But yeah, oh, it's, for just, sure. it's just a lot to put together. <laughs> for sure. So with that progression you were talking about, you know how with COVID, you guys kind of switched towards a different plan and realized some new things you guys wanted to go into. What are some future avenues you guys are potentially trying to look into? or some ways, you know, some areas you guys want to tap into with the other side club? If you can tell us, if it's not a secret. <laughs> oh yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So um, right now we're, we're trying to focus more on project-based stuff. So um, again, at, as a creative house with, with individuals with different perspectives coming from all over the world, I think one of our strengths is the ability to connect with different demographics because our team is made up of people from, from different places. And um, we kind of use that and channel it into kind of um, the various like brand campaigns that we're working on or maybe like product designs or um, potential like projects, like product sales that, that we may want to do. Um, so, sorry, what was the question? So I was just asking, like, because you guys have been like steadily progressing, you know, yeah. every time. And I was just wondering, like, if there's some future avenues, like some new areas oh, you guys are okay, okay, trying to okay, potentially okay. explore into. Yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, no, currently we are trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to add more to our portfolio. Um, because again, being realistic, we recognize that we're, we're still a really small, brand we're a really small group in, in the grand scheme of things um and with the level of impact that that we do want to make for our respective communities um we do need to grow beyond now um and, and one thing or, or one thing that we're, we're doing to grow more is um focusing more on the ability to collaborate with other people um be it people who are more established than us or people who are also just at the same stage as us just trying to figure things out for themselves um, because we, we do believe that, um, again, putting various minds together has the great ability to create something that's really, really successful. Um, so again, right now we're, we're tapping into various groups within our respective circles. So for people in Vancouver, potentially um, working or, or making talks with, with the plug and on working on various projects, um, also looking for various brands that we can create brand campaigns for. Um, um, using our ability to, I guess, create narratives and, and kind of aligning those narratives to potential like social issues happening in our communities or, or things that people actually care about. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to, you know, um, help companies realize markets that they would not have otherwise realized um, and giving people or a company's ability to, to see their brand and their customers um, in a different way. So again, right now, working more with brands and trying to do things along the lines of like brand campaigns and et cetera. Um, so we're at a position where um, we've worked with other people. So we kind of have that to tell. Um, so once we're, once we're ready to start creating our own stuff, um, the, there's kind of like a confidence and some sort of like reliability when it comes to our audience and just people watching. For sure. Okay, so one of the things that you you mentioned is how kind of diverse uh, the other side team has been, the different cultures that you guys have kind of brought together, the different demographics and so on. And obviously you've had a very diverse upbringing in your own being in different countries and being around all these different cultures. So how kind of like briefly, how's that exposure to so many new different cultures been? Because I know other side really, you guys push a lot of things from a lot of different areas of the world on your page. And for example, one post that I remember pretty vividly actually is, um because you mentioned you have someone from uh, Iran on the team. 
And there was a post talking about Iran and talking about perhaps some of the misconceptions that Iran gets and how people tend to build up this perspective of what Iran is while kind of ignoring kind of the depth of the really rich culture and history that the country has. So obviously you've been exposed to that and to Iranian culture. You've been exposed to a lot of different cultures. So how has that process been for you just growing up and learning through it over the last couple of years? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, just a, a really curious person. Um, and I think also right now, uh, at this point in time, there are a lot of people are beginning to realize the need to know more than they are just told. Um, so like, I guess on social media over the past couple of months, you've seen like a lot of like, a lot of accounts that are trying to teach people things, a lot of people that are learning and unlearning things. Mm. Um, so for, for, for me, I, I, I'm naturally kind of inclined to, to wanting to find out more about things. Um, and I think it also so happens that the rest of the world just had this kind of rude awakening where everyone is kind of more conscious about the kind of content that they consume. Um, so yeah, so so for me, in a sense, I'll say it's been, it's it's it's, it's a natural process. Um, it, it's more so if if this 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 a certain group of individuals or this like a certain story that I want to learn more about is more so just you know finding a documentary that can tell me something about it, watching it, educating myself, doing more research if if I like more research and and just kind of being satisfied with just consuming that knowledge and that information um because um i don't know i, I just i've just begun to, to value that more um and i think also because of circumstance um there's really nothing else to do than to just educate yourself at this point in time because there's so much there's so much happening in the world that you kind of need to you need to be in the same page otherwise you're going to get left behind yeah for sure a learning process for everybody which is good. I think it's something that is needed. Something that I found um, pretty dope as well with the other side, what you guys posted was that your platform, you kind of try to empower these different communities. So you try to create a bridge between, for example, the local and international communities, whether that be through the artists you represent, et cetera. And in your eyes, in what ways do you think art and what you guys are doing is able is it able to do that? Are you a, how are you able to bridge these things together? Art, art as a medium is very flexible. Um, a lot of history has been told, sorry. A lot of history has been told through art and we, we do see it as a really unbiased tool to educate people, but also an unbiased tool to get people to act upon things. Um, just because things right now are, are really, you know, like political things are really kind of, everyone kind of has their own perspective and idea about things. Um, but we, we do value art and, and the ability to, to be versatile and flexible in, in that nature. And the way that that we do believe that this is able to empower people is um, either, you know, giving them the ability to even contribute to the art themselves. So for, for something that we, we, we really like doing or, or something that we really value, again, like I've said, is being able to have that community aspect, give people, give people like an in into something you're doing. So be it, um, I guess, if it's just like a regular post I feel like something that takes a regular post from take something that differentiates a regular, you know, post from something that is has ability to empower people or get people informed is something that gives people the, I guess, the need to look forward to it. Because if someone, if someone has come to known or have some, some, someone stumbles upon your page and someone sees, I guess, something that's recurring, something that continuously teaches on something new, um, they're kind of expecting it. And then from there, that's how you're able to, to create a community of people who are not necessarily loyal, but a, a, like a community of people that know you for something and kind of expect to see that thing when they come to you. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of actually empowering people, 
um, again, I, I think for, for most people, there will be yes to kind of see us do this. Um, but these are kind of things that we kind of have in the works in terms of um, various brand projects or, I mean, brand campaigns that we're working on that seek to um, touch upon various things happening in our communities um, that seek to, I guess, um, create some sort of um, um, relief for, for certain groups of people, be it by, you know, teaching them the art that we know. Um, this can be as basic as, you know, teaching people how to like, you know, use Photoshop or being able to give various like communities ability to, you know, use these mediums to create a livelihood for themselves. Um, and I, I think as, 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 as young as we are, um, it really makes sense to, you know, start working with people who are probably younger than us, who will be able to, to learn from the various um, skills that, that we, we've gained. Um, so I guess in a nutshell, that's how we see our community aspect. That's how we see our ability to engage with people around us and in a sense, um, kind of empower them by giving them a piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, talking about art and music in general, I know recently you guys actually managed to put out your first in-house project, I believe, the EP. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? You know, who's behind that and what that came to yeah. be? Because I'm sure that was a, an exciting moment for you all. Yeah, I know. So th that the project you're speaking of um, is Colossian. Um, basically, huh, how, how do I... It was a project that was made throughout quarantine um, and it was kind of made because of like the energy of the team, if, if that makes sense. So Yano was an artist, Yano has been making music. Um, Yano has been kind of used in the past couple years to kind of define his sound um, and, you know, find something that's unique for himself um, and you know, when quarantine started, we realized that, yo, like this guy's, this guy's sound is actually fucking great right now. Um, he, he's, uh, we consider him an Afrofusion artist, um, but there isn't really any specific genre that we would classify him as just because um, we, we like the ability to be free in your creation process. So um, some songs you listen to, they may sound like reggae songs, some may sound like dancehall songs. Some may sound like a deep house, some may be like regular Afro beats, R&B, just being able to, to bring all these sounds together and just put something out there um, and then have people interact with it however they'll, they'll like. And for us, it is the, the beauty and just like being able to see people's interpretations of the art is what really drives us. Um, so with, with Colossian, like I said, um, again, during quarantine, that's when we kind of created our team so um certain most of the people on our team right now were kind of kind of joined during this period um and during this period we're all kind of getting to know each other um we were kind of building the identity of the group um and then yano was also around during that process so what was happening was as a team we always met um every day at like 3 p.m because again it was summer break, it was quarantine, nothing else was going on. So we literally spent a lot of time together just FaceTiming or just chatting on Discord. Um, and I felt like through that time, we, we grew much closer together. Um, and we, again, kind of begun creating the identity of the team. And um, that, that was something that really influenced the creation of Colossian and, and kind of just like the, the lingo that went into that. So Colossian is our own word. I forget what Colossian means right now. So you can like cut that part out because it was it was made by Auden and we just all started saying it, but I, I forget what it means. But I'll actually try to remember what it means and you can like write it somewhere. But um yeah. How was that creation process? So it was it was made in Atlanta. Um and, and that's where Yano is based. Um, so yeah, no, for, for the most part, trying to channel kind of the, the energy that he was seeing from the team in terms of our ability to progress, um, our ability to, you know, delve into different industries, the ability to just like try to act upon our ideas as opposed to just talk about them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was like a sense of like motivation and energy that that's still a part of the team now. Um, that kind of like motivated the creation of that. So 
in a nutshell, I'd say Colossian is like the identity of other side during quarantine. I don't know. That, that was what we're feeling. <laughs> are we are we ever going to get a, a Sylvester guest verse? Maybe a little hook, a little ad lib on the next project? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little um, something for the people. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, 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 oh, damn. Why does my Siri keep going off? Um, <laughs> bruh. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll... I'll uh, I'll surprise you. I'll surprise you, but nah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't tell you if I have something coming up. But you, you'll see. You'll find uh, out. You'll bet, find out. Bet, bet. <laughs> um, I wanna before we we get close to kind of wrapping it up here. Obviously, other side is a huge part of your life. You're also part of the uh, AMS Society at UBC. You do a lot of work um, with them. Do you want to kind of talk about what role that's been playing in your life, what you're doing for the AMS and stuff like that over the last year or so in like a general sense? Yeah. In a general sense. Um, so at the AMS, I am the, the VP admin, uh, which is uh, an elective student position. Um, plays a, a really huge part in my life currently just because it's it's an experience that I, I feel like I, I like it, if I didn't get it now there, there there would be nowhere where I would have gotten this experience at least nowhere like nowhere in the near future mm -hmm. just because it's kind of like a like a really it's, it's a managerial position where again I'm in, a, in, a, in an environment where I'm managing a team of people um, you know, prior to this, I, I did work in a group, but I didn't really have these many, I guess, like people to, to look over or to kind of like help like direct. Um, so it's been it's been it's been a lot of great experiences and a lot of great opportunities in terms of looking at things from a different perspective. Um, as a student, um, there there's so many things that you would do without like thinking twice and you just do them because you want to do them. But right now in this position, there are certain things that I just can't do just because like I I, I think too much about mm -hmm. the various repercussions of them. Mm -hmm. But I also see things from a perspective um, outside from the, the regular, I guess, like naive, oblivious, like student view and things, um, which I really, really cherish. Um, and, and like it's quite unfortunate that I, I only really found this avenue in my last year because I, I really do think that um that there is a lot a lot to gain from being involved um in your student society or just any society um in, in general um as students in university um these are pivotal times where there's so many experiences um that are being presented to you at literally no cost at all it's just a matter of putting yourself out there and and, and like you know like and grabbing them um, and I think that's something that I've tried my best to, to do. Um, and to anyone listening, if you're still in university, like definitely take advantage of your time and the resources available to your university, because once you're out of here, it's it's the real world and, and things get hard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, in a nutshell, um, I really love the opportunity to, um, I guess, give back to my student community um, give back to, to individuals um, whose shoes I've been in before um, and, and being able to, you know, bring some new fresh ideas to the table and see, you know, what else we, we can do together yeah. to see what else we can do together as a society. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with the points you made about, um, you know, getting, you know, you go to university and doing more than just being a student, doing doing your little social life and all that, like you get so many opportunities to work somewhere, join a society, find a job, do this project, do that project. Like you got these four or five years or how, however many to do so many different things. Like you said, at, at zero to like little to no cost, you know, and it's kind of, it's been like, that's been a huge part and a super rewarding part of my university experience, you know, not just what I came to university expecting to do, you know, which is you go to class and you meet people, but like so many different avenues that you can touch upon and opportunities that you get. So I think that's huge for, you know, this this is a unique period yeah. in your life, and that's that's kind of a huge part of that. I exactly, because it's it's so easy to just sit down and and feel like, oh, like school is like really stressful. School is like a lot, so you're just gonna do school. But like, once school is over, 
like you're gonna need more than just school to like tell mm -hmm. about yourself right and um growing up like in high school i i really like doing like other things as well so i think um yeah no just try to get out of your comfort zone and you know burst that bubble exactly i know you just touched up upon like this being your last year of university as well and we talked about the other side's plans going into the future but you yourself personally what are some of your aspirations or goals do you see yourself continuing with the music industry in that avenue as well yeah um i i i like options um i i am an individual who likes to put himself um in a position where i i could i could uh yeah sorry let me give me a second so yeah no i i like, like options i think that um as humans it's really it's really tough if you only really have one direction to go in and if that's not the direction you want to go in um it, it could be like the make or like it could break your career um so for me um moving forward um i'm, I'm really just taking things as they come um obviously uh, Finally, year in university, I am considering potentially doing grad school or maybe it's like working after. So obviously making sure I'm sending in my applications, um, which I am doing. Um, but also other side will always be a part of me, um, regardless of where I am. Um, I, I do see a lot of room for growth and, and I do believe that we will be able to initiate that growth. Um, and the industries that we're currently in, um, we will continue to be in them and potentially expand. Um, so my own personal goal is to, you know, just continue doing everything I'm doing and, and trying to do it in the highest level possible and always making sure that there's something in it for someone else and not just me. And then I think, um, yeah, and that, that's kind of me in a nutshell. No, that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, I think we've had we've had an amazing conversation before we let you out of here though i want to yeah. get into the last little segment of the podcast we do a little little top five draft we didn't on last week we're running it back this week um topic of this week's draft will be so you're stuck on a desert island you get to bring five albums with you they're going to keep you going that's your only music on that island for the whole time you're a music guy so i know you got some heat planned for this we'll uh We'll do a little little snake order. Oh. So Sly, you'll pick first. Then Leke, I'll get two picks. Then Leke, back to Sly for two picks. And we'll do that for about like five picks each. So What's Sly, up? if you want to start us off with your first album, what you got? Damn, that's, that's tough. That's tough. That's tough. Huh. I'll say, well, I'm a really huge J. Cole fan. Um, and... Well, okay, my, my, my favorite artist is so my albums are gonna come. So it's just, let's say, J. Cole's the first person that comes to mind now. So, mm -hmm. I, huh, this is, He's got I'll it. say Forest, Forest Hills Drive. Forest Hills Drive. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's my one. first pick. That's a good one. That's Forest crazy. Hills you Drive said or J. Cole. Born Sinner. One of those two would be my, like, one of the albums in my top five. See, seeing Forest Hills Drive live, probably one of the best shows that I've been to. Yeah, oh, in Vancouver? Yeah. No, nah, this was back in Switzerland. This was in Zurich a while back, yeah. back when it dropped. That was oh, like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, 2014 yeah. here, definitely on in Vancouver. Yeah, man, that was, a, that was an experience, though. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, that's crazy you said J. Cole, because actually I was going to go with J. Cole as well for my first pick. Yeah. But um, I'm going to throw it back a little bit more and say – Friday Night Lights from him. Okay. Like, yeah, that's a classic. All right, I got two picks. So, see if I'm if I'm on a if I'm on a desert, I got five albums. They need to express all the vibes that I'm going to be experiencing on this island. Yeah. They need to be different, you know, because I'm not always in the same mood when I'm on this island. Mm. So, my first mm. album, if I'm on an island, I'm probably going to be, you know, trying to work out and fill my time with shit. I need something to get me hyped up. Drake and Future, what a time to be alive. Has to be. That's my that's my classic since high school. I got to go with Waiting that. Waiting on number two. I got to go with that one. And wow, then... That's crazy. That's crazy. For my, for my second pick, this is one a lot of people might not know, but I'm going D'Angelo, Voodoo, a classic R&B soul album from 
late 90s, early 2000s. If you haven't listened to it, listen to it. That's the most relaxing album you'll ever come across in your life. So that's perfect when I'm just trying to chill out on the island, you know. Yeah. So lucky what you got next. I need to make sure I have a a good mix too. Yeah, right. So if we're talking different mixes, I think J. Cole is like the more chill, you know, neutral kind of vibe, especially Friday Night Lights. But if I'd want to get like a bit amped up, you know, get a workout in over there. I'd have to go with future Dirty Sprite too. Ooh, yeah. That's tough. That's tough. Sly, you got two picks. What you come with? Um, my two picks. I would say I gotta I gotta get some Kendrick on there. So, huh? Fuck. For Kendrick, I wish I could just like create a playlist. I'm supposed to choose an album, but yeah. like. I would say to pimp a butterfly, and my second one after that um, would be Jesus. Jesus, okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I could listen to Jesus that much. Really? Yeah. Bro, that's an intense Jesus. album, man. Bro, where does Jesus rank in your Kanye top albums? Is it up there for you? Um. It's up there. It's up there. Like I think it was one of the albums that like I really kind of listened to the most. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, no, it's a, I don't know where exactly, but it's definitely my top five as of now. Okay. I may regret it once I'm actually stranded. <laughs> once he's playing, <laughs> once he's playing Jesus for the twentieth time, he's gonna be the guy. Black black skin hat is definitely gonna drive me crazy. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, is it me? Yeah. Like um, all right. So I have my trap. I have my coal. So if I'm going for my third one, I got to go Drake. Nothing was the same. Mm. Can't go wrong with Drake. Can't go wrong with Drake. All right. I got, I got two picks. So my first pick, I'm a hop on the Kendrick wave, but I'm going good kid, mad city for my first one. And then my second pick, I might, I gotta, I gotta go something old school, switch it up a bit. So I'll take, um, Notorious B.I.G. Ready to Die, you know, Mm. something different, something a little, a little more old school, but something that I will still enjoy the hell out of on this island. So like it, what you got? I need some more calm, some more R&B-ish. So I'd go with the classic Alicia Keys. The Diary of Alicia Keys. Okay. It was soulful, you know, on the island. Okay. (laughs) That's tough. That's tough. Yep. Um, hmm. Last two picks. I think I I feel like my my entire list is just going to be rap, to be honest. Um, Because, like, that's all that's coming to mind right now, so. If you don't put um, Kalashi on, on the list. A lot of people. Yeah, are bro, got you. You, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was I was going to put Clash on there because you know it has uh it brings you know different genres so mm. I, I I can listen to that on repeat forever, um so I'm gonna put Clash on there not because she said it but because it's gonna come <laughs> but um and then I guess my my last one on there I'll say I don't know I, it's it's a Drake album but I don't, I don't know which one. I don't know which one because he's like I would have picked if you're reading this is too late, but you already picked that. Am I allowed to pick something that's already been picked, or did or pick no? That? Wait, didn't oh, no, you nobody, pick that? I don't said, think I oh, had, okay. Nothing was the same. Yeah. Okay, never mind. If you're reading it, it's too late. Because 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 that Let's one hit me different. It just came out of nowhere. So yeah, it was true, very true, very true, monumental for me. Yeah. <laughs> true. All right, lucky. It's your last pick. Oh yeah, how could I not go? It's my guy, Burna Boy, African Giant. I was about to pick that. Damn, can I redo <laughs> this list? Can I redo this list? <laughs> Man, I was about to, bro, because Burna Boy will be perfect for being on that. Yeah, album. you oh, know what? The fuck perfect it. vibe. Ign- ignore everything I just said. This is my top five list. I'm gonna say it right now. <laughs> Fucking J Hus Common Sense. Wait, okay. that, was, that was the name of that. Was that that was the name of the album, right? Yeah, I think so. the last one. Okay, 
yeah so the one that had like spirit um kind of um i guess friendly and, and all those hits yeah, 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 yeah. definitely j Huss. um stormzy fucking uh gang signs gang signs and prayers okay these, these are my actual albums i'm actually looking on my my, my, <laughs> my playlist right okay, now okay. Yeah. before i was just talking out of my uh, talking out of my ass so you know j Huss, fucking common sense um gang signs and prayers and then i'll probably say for reading against it's too late jesus uh -huh. and then um the kendrick um fuck j cole or kendrick oh j cole Oh, Burns Hills Drive. Versus I. So you got your new top five. Um, I got my new top five now. What am I? I got my last pick. What am I going for? Might have to do um. So now you got me thinking about some UK <laughs> albums. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Leke Le took Burna Boy from me, which is disappointing, because I love African Giant. I'm gonna go. I'll go with Solange. Her last album. I forget the name of it actually. When I get home. That's a great album. Oh, I'm taking that for my five. So I got all my different moods. I'm cozy. I'm cozy on this island. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, I may. I may. I may need some tunes from from you two once I, I I begin to to you know get crazy with all the all the bangers going on. Oh, for sure. <laughs> once you guys take a Jesus, you'll have to swap that one. Out. <laughs> yeah. But... All right. Well, shit. So I, it was a pleasure to have you on, man. It was an amazing nah, conversation. It was a pleasure to have you. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Um, what's the name of your what's the name of your podcast? No cap. No cap. No cap. No cap. Um, no what, 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 what inspired this? Man, I mean, at least we felt we felt that we wanted to put together a project. We're bringing on people of different avenues, young people to kind of, you know, talk about what they're doing for themselves uh, in whatever aspect of life they may be involved in it could be sports it could be music it could be fitness culinary or whatever and just kind of bring that on have people talking about all these aspects of their life and like like it's purely it's it's factual it's what they really want to do who they really are who they really want to be and you know give give people a platform man like this isn't just for us to talk like we're not trying to talk about ourselves we're trying to hear from people from all around that we may know that we may not know who have, you know, something going on that we really want to give them a platform to provide for others to listen to, you know, and I think this was perfect to have you on to chat about your experiences so far. Oh, yeah, no, for sure, so. for sure, no, because, like, it was, it was kind of funny when you, uh, when, you when you brought it up, uh, like, a while back, because, like, mm -hmm. at, at that point in time, we were also, like, planning or to start our, our own podcast, but we just never really put it out, mm -hmm. Um. so, no, I'm really glad I was able to to get my you know test run on here oh, for sure. um, so i uh, hopefully hopefully that this turns out well and no it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here i think both of you um with, with various things that you're doing personally i, I do think that as young people we, we really have a, a huge role to play uh, in the world right now because mm. the boomers are really fucking it up mm. um so i think the, the more you can be around like-minded people talk about things going on around the world things that are dear to you um i think it's really healthy healthy for us and in the way that our minds grow absolutely um, so no always yeah. always got to keep a, a, a conversation happening because you never know what what someone can make out of that so no good job, yeah. good job. and like yeah, you said yeah. you know now is a great time to do these projects you know you're young you know make your podcast do your videos yeah. do your content creation do whatever you want to be doing and for everybody yeah. It's, you got so many opportunities. You just got to hop on. Go out there and chase your dreams, man. Just don't be afraid really? to try something new. Yeah. No cap. Exactly. And we got the no podcast cap. name in there, too. <laughs> exactly. All facts, no yeah. fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys, do, do you guys have, like, ad-libs? Do you have, like, ad-libs? Oh, we like, were, kind of we were like, hoping you would do the ad-libs, bro. We want to do the ad-libs. Yeah. For, it's going gonna to be the ad-libs for the entire series? Say no more. <laughs> no more. I'm, I'm gonna send you some voice some voice notes soon. yeah I'll have to just do really <laughs> bet, quick. Bet. all right for sure for sure all right take it easy guys it's a pleasure to touch have a good one, man. Um, thank you so much man. thank you for hopping sure. on bro easy peace